Okay, welcome back again to Big Talk from Small Libraries 2018. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. We are at our three o'clock central time session, and um, our topic right now is, can you hear me now? I hope you can hear me, because I'm talking, yes? Everyone can hear us? <laughs> um, Library library advocacy for all libraries. On the line with us is Lisa Valerio Noak. Is that how you pronounce it? I didn't ask before. Yes, it is. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And she is from the Royal Oak Township um, Library in Royal Oak Township, Michigan. And she is the library administrator and director there. And she is going to talk to us about how she is do, um, doing advocacy, which is a big topic in all libraries. Um, and I think very especially into our small and rural ones who sometimes are from either extremes. They have t a ton of support from the live from the community because they are a, 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 a core of it or are maybe not so known, which is sad. So I will hand it over to you, Lisa, to tell us how to do this. Thank you, Krista, and um, thanks for having me. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about Can You Hear Me Now and Library Advocacy for Library. And I think um, one of the best things about being a librarian is that we always get to talk about our profession. People are always asking me questions about books, programs, and so forth, and my biggest passion has always been for small libraries. I've worked in small libraries for a while. So I'm going to tell you a little bit um, um, about what I've done and where I'm from and so forth and what you can do in your own libraries and communities. But first of all, I wanted to give a shout out to, I heard there was a library cooperative in Michigan and I'm from Michigan, so a yes. shout out to you guys. <laughs> okay, so number one, um, who I am. I have worked in libraries for over 25 years. Uh, in that time, I have been in a county library, a small college library, uh, a college prep private school librarian, and directors of two different libraries, uh, vastly different. One was rural, way out in the countryside, and one urban. And the one that I'm in right now is an urban library. We're right outside of Detroit, uh, and we serve a population of just under 2,500. Royal Oak Township Public Library began in 1965, and um, that was due by a grant, um, government grants and push to, for urban renewal back in 1965. And it is a vibrant community, but unfortunately, um, I've been there now only for a year. Um, they used to be 40 hour library, 40 hours a week library, now it's down to 21 hours a week. And um, I'm the part-time library director. I have two employees, but that's kind of a misnomer because one, um, part-time employee is paid by Urban League, which gives uh, seniors a chance to um, get a part-time job, and Urban League pays them, not my library. And the other one is employed by the township to work in the library with me. And we have numerous volunteers, so I'm very lucky that I have a community that um, has found a home in my library. Now, if you go over to see this picture over here, that is the outside sign for my library in little old Royal Oak Township. We are located in a very uh, different setting. Uh, the township offices are in a old school building and we are in the old school library of that old school building. And it's, it's kind of nice because it's small and cozy, but by the same token, um, Nobody knows we're there. We're in a community of 2,500 where everyone says, oh, we have a library? And I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> Come to the second floor and you'll find us. So that's um, when I got into this job as the library director, my biggest thing was that I wanted to let everyone know we are here and that you can hear us, you can see us, you can visit us and come and visit us. So um, with that in mind, a few facts about small libraries that probably everyone already knows, but it's nice to keep in mind is that small and rural libraries make up 80.5% of public library system in the United States. Small and rural libraries continue to provide substantial electronic resources, uh, digital resources for patrons through access to ebooks and publicly accessible computer terminal. terminal. 
This is despite the fact that budgets continue to be strained. In my library right now, we have about 15, no, excuse me, 19 computers, and um, it's all done through grants, help through E-rates and so forth, and we're still able to keep up um, as best we can with the needs of technology. And then even though uh, revenues have decreased over the years, visitation and circulation have uh, been increasing, which to me would tell me, or be, should be able to tell um, people in uh, higher positions like mayors and business leaders that libraries are very much needed in every community, but um, sometimes that just gets overlooked. And we are the lifeline for the community in which we serve. A lot of times, uh, the children that are coming into my library, this is the only place they've got to go to after school. It's either this or an empty house at home um, where they're waiting for mom, dad, uncle, aunt, uh, grandparent to come home and help them with homework. Um, I remember when, um, way back when, I, when I was very young, and when I started out in libraries, everyone was saying that the internet was going to destroy libraries. There would be no need for libraries after the internet. And actually, thank goodness for the internet because it actually helped us a lot more in our advocacy and getting out there and showing um, a need for a library. So we have access to online databases now through the state. Um, the patrons had access. Things that I never really considered that you would need a computer for, um, they're using our computers for, like for their own email, because that's the only way to get um, communications with their child's teacher to the school district. If they have to um, fill out forms for um, their bridge cards or their uh, government assistance, or get assistance through the consumer's energy or heating bill or electric bill and they're filling out the paperwork to make sure they can still have heat and electricity in their home. That, that's what they're using our computers for and we are um, very much needed for them for just that um, alone. And for com uh, computers for homework, uh, kids don't have um, the computers that they need at home to be able to do their homework. A lot of times, their uh, teachers are now asking kids to do PowerPoint presentation, um, word, basic word processing like reports, and those kind of programs or um, computer programs are not accessible to them because of financial need. So we're there for them. So having the internet and having the computers and all that other wonderful um, capability has actually helped us. And what I've always found with advocacy and in every small library that I've worked in, advocacy means telling the stories, library story over and over again until it clicks. You can tell your story at least once to one person and they're like, yeah, yeah, um, it's fine. I get what you're saying. You have a great library, you have a great program. But maybe on that day, they're not listening for some other reason, they're preoccupied about something else, um, going to a concert that night or whatever. The next time you see them, you tell the story again and again until they finally get it like, hey, you know what, um, that program that you were telling me about in the library, are you still having it? Are you gonna have it again? I would have liked to have come and things of that nature. So you gotta tell your story a lot of time and sometimes you have to tell it in different ways. I'm always reminded of the elevator speech where someone said, um, you have to give your um, elevator speech in two seconds or two minutes to get someone's attention. Well, you can give that elevator speech and have it practiced and down to a, a science. But sometimes if you mix it up a little bit and tell it a little bit differently, they hear you. And I have, um, I've always, I never refuse anyone's help to promote what your library does for the community. I have a gentleman at my library who comes in quite often. He's um, deaf and he's an advocate for the deaf. And a lot of people find him to be a little bit um, pushy about his um, wanting to help deaf people. Like he'll talk to anybody. 
But when he comes into the library and he wants to talk about my library to people and he's getting the message across, not only to the hearing patron, but also to the non-hearing, the hearing impaired, and it's getting them into my library. So I could stay easily like um, someone at the, when I first came into the job, they said, don't ask him to be, you know, around in the library, talking about the library that much because, you know, he gets people upset. He may get one person upset, but he actually started to bring more people in the library with um, the group that he started to teach sign language to. So I didn't want to refuse his help. He, he's passionate about what he believes in, helping the deaf. And if he feels that the library can help him, help the, his deaf community, then I want to be there for him. And I want him to bring these people in so that we can help them. So I never refuse anyone's help. And if you look at Webster's Dictionary, they define advocacy as the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. I've always said, no matter what library you're working in, if I'm working in Royal Oak Township and I have a day off and uh, another neighboring library is having um, uh, a program where it's promoting them and promoting libraries in general, I will go over to that library and I will join them if I can. I will, you know, lend a hand, I will volunteer because libraries really need to, and, and librarians, and we do this very well, I have to admit, we need to really um, help each other out in this area. We need to be able to not only sing our own voices or sing our own songs about our library, but we should be doing it for all the other libraries too. The more we um, band together, the better. So the big question is, why do it? Why be an advocate? Why throw yourself out there and always talk about library? And it always has come back to me, at least, that you can't, your community depends on the library. Everything that you do for that community is, is the whole reason why um, they're coming to the library. It's the whole reason why things might be going for a better day for them. They're depending on you to do it. And your library depends on advocacy. At the, um, I guess in a way I'm trying to say that it's a, um, it's a joint commit, commitment between you and the, your community. If you don't do this for your community, your library is going to die. And if your library dies, your community is now left without any resources. So it's a joint operation there. So where to start? Start with your staff, start with your peers, start with your friends. Let them know your passion. Talk about the library. Talk about what your library is doing. Talk about what another library is doing. Sometimes that helps um, by even me watching the other two um, presenters before me. I was getting ideas of what I could do in my own library. And so I'm going to be bringing this back to my friends, my peers, um, staff meetings that I go to, and tell them about what other libraries are doing. And that's where you get started by talking. Um, you go to your local leaders in your government. I uh, go to my um, township supervisor, the clerks, anyone that I can get into our corner and willing to help me out to do what I need to do as a library director, I will reach out to. Business leaders, you will be surprised how many times business leaders will overlook a, a library because they don't think they have anything there for the library. I am now reminded many of our business leaders that we have resources for businesses to use um, that will help them um, start a business. Uh, they can, uh, we have resources for um, tracking business trends. We have a Melcat, which allows people, um, uh, the databases for business, uh, Wall Street Journal and Forbes and all that. And they think, wow, you're a small little library, but you can do that. And that really impresses them. So go out to your businesses, invite them in to, um, to visit the library. And then your patrons, your diehard patrons. Um, I, I will use my uh, kids in the library to have them tell their parents or their grandparents or their classmates or their school what a great time they had at our library and whatever programs we have use them and they get excited too and they will tell you um, if they think something was you know a total you know downer or if something was the best time they've ever had 
um, kids are very, very honest with you sometimes. And sometimes it's a little bit too honest, but I would rather take that too, on, too much honesty and be able to use it for the good for the library. And take uh, when you start to do advocacy for your library or for a cooperative, um, you have to take away the excuses from yourself, um, from your library board, and from your community, especially from yourself and the library board. Um, a lot of times I've heard that we can't have another program that just focuses on the needs for funding of the library because we don't have time. We don't have the um, staff. Uh, we don't have the energy. No one's really interested in it. And they keep finding all the excuses of not to do something a little bit different that will promote the library. And even from the community, um, sometimes they'll say, oh, you know, you're going to have a read-in. Oh, that, that sounds like it's going to have to take too much time. I don't have all day to read a book. And things like this that may be little hurdles that you need to take away the excuses and show it more in a positive light. And even for myself, I've often found that um, as a library director in a small library, there are days when I feel like I have to do everything from the plumbing uh, to um, checking out books to reading the books and then do my state statistics. And sometimes when you feel all that um, piling on you, you start to think, oh, yeah, I can do one more thing. Let me write a letter to the editor because I've got nothing else to do, right? You got to take away those excuses because then you realize in the end it's more worth it to have that letter written to the editor or to ask someone, one of your patrons, to write a letter to the editor to show the benefits of the library. So what do you need the most? And most people think it's going to be, oh, you need lots of money to do this. Not really. Most of the things that you need are things that you can just be able to do over coffee. You need ideas, you need energy, and you need manpower, or as I like to say, librarian power. Um, for those moments when you're thinking um, you can do a program that's simple and effective, get that uh, energy going, that librarian power mode going, and get down with just a couple of people and get the ideas out and start fleshing something out. Advocacy, just like anything else, needs to have a plan and a way to put it forward. You can't just say, um, I'm gonna advocate for the library starting tomorrow, and you will have a program to sign it. Um, if you're gonna be doing a program on advocacy, then you're gonna have to plan ahead. But if you're gonna just be doing advocacy in the way of, oh, I'm gonna talk to my neighbor tomorrow and um, tell them about the library, that's easy enough to do. That's the lazy person. <laughs> um, advocacy, but I'll take the lazy person advocacy over doing nothing at all any day. So planning is everything. And even if you're going to do it the way I said, just talk to a neighbor or talk to a coworker, always stick to a message. If your message is the library is important, stick to that. Know your audience. Know if it's a coworker, you're going to be telling them um, you know about them, you know what they like, you know what they don't like. Talk about programs that they might like. And when you're doing something bigger, like um, if you're doing uh, library advocacy because you need a new millage, because you need a new building built for your library, and your um, audience is going to be the taxpayers. So any taxpayers that you are going to be reaching, you're going to have to go to their level, what they're worried about, what they're thinking about. Oh, no, another tax increase. Show them how that tax decree is a benefit, not uh, a negative. And you craft your plan to fit the message. And always think about getting outside help, no matter wherever you can get it. And the show must always go on. Every day I say, um, what is something new that I could do for the library? Or if I have a program that I'm having my doubts about, I, it's always better to go with the flow than just to say, uh, you know, maybe we should just cancel the program because I don't think enough people are going to be coming. And the, the five do's of library advocacy, do respect everyone, even politicians who don't agree with you. And I have found my way into um, politicians' office from state reps. Um, I've gone to their town halls. 
Um, I've even talked to my own um, political leaders in the township and um, even when they don't agree with me, I always shake their hand, smile and give them a positive feeling afterwards because even if we don't see eye to eye now, we will down the road because I'm not gonna give up. And always keep it positive, work hard and that's the, that the hardest part of it is knowing that you're gonna have to keep doing this. As I said earlier, you're gonna have to keep telling your story over and over again until it clicks. Don't give up. If one way doesn't work, try another way. Um, and as you can see, there's a theme here. I'm always asking for help. I'm, and what I should have put there instead of do ask for help, and what I should have reminded to you um, is don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't think that you can't go up to the mayor to ask him to do a story time because you think they're gonna say no. Okay, that's the worst he's gonna do. Say no. Invite him to the library, do a story time with him. Have him read to the kid. Have him see for himself how the kid likes to be um, read to you and the positive influences that are happening through this interaction. And, um, and if he says no this time, keep asking. Keep telling him that he needs his library just as much as his library needs him. And always keep it simple. I, um, the more elaborate I've tried to get in some program, and some advocacy where I'd write these long essays and um, you know to try to prove my point about advocacy, people are turned off by that. They don't want something long. They don't feel like they have something long to read. So if you keep it simple, a little handout, say this is the value that you're getting for your library. You tell me what other values you would like from the library and make it very, very simple and very um, much patron or people oriented because you want these people to come into your library. And um, these are five ideas where you can turn the talk into action. Um, one of them I put as a group hug for libraries. Very simple thing that you can do. It's like holding, a, it's like a, holding hands around the library. You form a chain around your building. Um, you and it's just a hug around the library, a group hug for the library. And you can do this on a summer reading program. You can say uh, right before um, a tax increase, or not tax increase, I should call it that, um, right before a millage where you need a new building or you need more money to keep the building open. Um, make it visible for everyone to see outside the library. So as they're walking by the library or driving by the library, they see people um, gathering together to make a statement. Um, children's rally, one of the cuter things I've um, seen, I have not tried this yet myself, but I will, um, is having kids make their own little signs about the library and what they love about the library and have them do a mini um, walk around the library then. You don't have to take them anywhere far or do anything fancy. It's just enough that people that are coming into your library are, come, are coming to see. Lucky for me, and um, I believe in a lot of small towns and townships, the um, township halls are nearby. So if there is going to be a meeting for the um, township where the leaders are gonna be there, and my military is coming up, you better believe I'm gonna get something really cute to advocate for the library. Have these cute little three-year-olds walk by with a sign that say, I love story time. How can you say no to that? Yeah. It's like saying no People to a puppy. People can't resist the kids, can't, can't, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, and, and, and you'd feel bad because you would feel like you're kicking a puppy. You don't wanna do that. So yeah. <laughs> make, it cute, make it effective and, it, and it's simple. Kids love to do that. A mini read-in, I did that once um, when I was a children's librarian in St. Clair Shores, um, where we did it through summer reading club and the kids just came in, they signed up for a slot and their parents too, so this was intergenerational. They um, came in and they had a little sign that said they were part of the reading and that they loved to read and they read for um, however long they said they were going to read, like for a half hour or an hour. And that turned to be very effective because People were coming in all throughout the day just to read a book. And that was um, the point that I would try to make then, when not so much about how important libraries was, was that reading is very important and very fundamental. 
And yeah, um, people should take time out of their day to read. It was it was perfect. Um, mini March was uh, a mini March around your uh, library with sign and pickets like they used to do um, in the protest days, and I think they still do. Um, you can do that in, in a small scale. And doing a library art quilt. Um, it's not really a quilt. It's usually construction paper or pieces of paper with artwork on it um, that you can put together and make it to a big quilt. Um, I wish I had the picture with me for Valentine's Day. We did in our library um, what you love, and we had little hearts, and we put it all over our back window because we got this great big back window in the library, and we filled it all up with hearts. And some of them were very cute and very decorative, but the one that I really loved the most was um, one of the boys who is a regular of ours made a little heart, and he just Real simple said, I love here. And I said, this is this is perfect. I go, you could have put the library. And he said, yeah, but I didn't know how to spell library. So I love here. And I went, okay, good enough for me. And we have that right in the center of our, we had it right in the center of our window. And I thought that was a perfect testament of um, what our library means to the community. So, I have people say that if they do advocacy, what if it's, what if the program or the advocacy effort failed miserably? So what? Move on. You find a, another idea, another avenue to go down. Don't be afraid to fail. Um, what if you have a um, advocacy program where you're talking about how great the library would be if they had the millage? You have unruly guests, like people who are totally against libraries and library millages and any taxes of any kind, what if they show up? Fine, um, let them show up, but if they become unruly, you have someone there, you have a, a plan to put into place to get them removed, security, okay? What if the weather is bad and you're having an outdoor um, readathon? That's okay, make provision that maybe you might have to have a tent to be sure that the weather is bad. But this is the question that I always ask librarians who are afraid to do anything outside the box for advocacy, what if the program is a total success? And wouldn't that be wonderful? We gotta stop thinking about the what if everything is awful to making what if everything turns out okay or better than we expected. And a lot of times with the advocacy, even if you change one person's mind about the library, you're one step closer to getting what you need to help your patron, your library, your community to be better. And I always see that as a step forward. So if you have um, advocacy going on in your library, uh, you know, it should be every day because your staff should be on board with this. I have little talking points that I will put on uh, the circulation desk and even in my own office. This is when people ask me, why do we need libraries? Why should we fund libraries? Why should we even um, give our tax dollars for it when everyone has their own computers? Remind them, we are there for help for small businesses and job seekers. Um, where else can you be able to go into a building and just use your computer to type up a resume or print up your resume that you've already done like that? I mean, you know, you can't even do that in, um, Kinko's anymore. Um, libraries are the community story keepers. We're the ones who remember the past, keep the past, you know, alive because we have the records, we have the old yearbooks. Um, people come to the library to remember what they used to do in the library with their story time and they bring their kids. We're very much part of the culture of that community. Um, libraries are cost effective and help the community and household save money. I'm always telling the parents, kids need to read, 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 read. If they tell me they can't go to Barnes & Noble every day or every week to buy a book, I totally get that. Come to the library, check out a book or two or three and read it that way. And that way you're not spending the money as much money as you would have going to Barnes & Noble. You just return the books. And one of, especially in the area that I'm working in right now, libraries offer safe places for kids and teens. This is so important to me because I'm, those kids need to have a place 
to be after school instead of um, going to God knows where, you know, playing out on the street or roaming the streets while roaming, yes. yeah, roaming yeah. Back. I mean, I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you know, if I have a hula hoop, I will certainly throw it out uh, the window this summer if I see them hanging out in the parking lot. If they're not doing anything else, at least they'll get their exercise. Um, and library the Democrat. And um, that is to say anyone is allowed in the library. We don't make any judgment. We don't say you can come in, but he can't. We are very democratic and um, the doors are always open and the doors should always be open. So for library advocacy, social media, um, as all of you know, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, Snapchat um, flyers, um, talking points to keep um, for you and your staff um, at the front desk and checklist. I always go, uh, if I'm ever having a program where I'm trying to promote a most important for the library, I have my little checklist going and I have a camera. And I now that we've got smartphones, I am so thrilled with smartphones because I would always forget my camera. Um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would say, oh my gosh, I'm having a program or I'm advocating for libraries and we're having the, you know, the big villages coming up and I wanna show how many people are there. I would forget my camera at home. Or the camera at the library, we would forget to change the battery and the, and the battery is dead and we didn't have uh, the camera. So now for smartphones, thank goodness for them, we can snap a picture whenever we want. So these are things that you um, probably already know, and I'm assuming. But with social media, I always keep it fun. I always ask for people to respond back too. Click like, say hello, um, tell me how you like the story time. I don't get any responses back, but at least I'm asking for it. Flyers should always be um, po uh, very positive and very bright, eye-catching. And uh, as I said, I used the talking points that I showed you in the previous um, uh, slide at the desk, so then my so then I can be um, focused as well as my staff and, and my checklist. So right here, I am going to show you, these are pictures of my library. Picture is worth a thousand words, and this is so true. Um, right over here, you see um, one of our little patrons dictating to the kids what kind of um, Valentine she's going to make. And if you look in the back, you'll see how we started decorating. This was the beginning of our decoration. So they were just having a ball with crayons, you name it. Um, by the end of this, they, they conned me into getting glitter, which I'm kind of sad I brought that out because it ended up getting into the carpet and I've been vacuuming ever since. Um, right over here is um, one of our story times with the moms and the little toddlers. And they were having uh, a great time doing the craft after the, after the story time. And right here, this was one of our best programs that we had this past summer, and it was with the solar eclipse glasses. Um, I told the kids how to use the solar eclipse glasses because uh, it was coming August 21st, and it was a partial eclipse. So I, I explained to them what an eclipse was and how long the eclipse was going to be, and you will not believe how many people came into my library to number one, get solar eclipse glasses. Number two, they went, oh my gosh, we didn't even know you were here and they have since come back. And number three, the kids had a ball with the glasses. They, um, when I told them to try the glasses on, they were amazed that they couldn't see anything, not even their own hand in front of them. And I said, that's because they're supposed to protect your eye. So here's a picture of them with the solar eclipse glasses. And I thought they were going to be um, serious. And instead, um, they decided to be a little bit more of themselves and show how cool they were. And this is, these are my peeps. And like I said, after when I put this picture up on Facebook and said, you know, at the library, you can not only get books, you can get solar eclipse glasses. I had tons of people come in. And as a bonus, I wasn't expecting this. I had donations to the library, monetary donations to the library because they said, wow, this is a nice 
little library that you have here. We want to help. So that was a bonus that I didn't expect. So my checklist is always this. I'm the director. If someone were to come up to me and say, I want to do something to create um, you know, uh, advocacy or attention to the library and show how great it is, I would say, yay, go for it. I will help you in every way I can, but also go to the library board. Um, I'm fortunate enough that my library board is very um, active and interested in seeing our library succeed. So getting the okay from them is like second nature to me. I don't even have to think about it. I know I'm going to get it. But there are some uh, library boards that are a little bit worried about doing this like they don't like asking for money or whatever i don't know uh, but always get them on board tell the world about how great library it is um not once and not even twice i would say tell it until you're blue in the face um because people need to be reminded and remember friends who can help um right now our library does not have a friends in the library group and I am looking into getting one because um, they could be so helpful in getting more money for the library and not only that and also being your advocate and don't overlook the obvious there are people that come into your library that are very very quiet they don't say much but they use your library a lot and sometimes you forget to use them um, when I got into the job um, a while ago um, there was this one gentleman that was coming in and he um, never said anything. He just said hello and goodbye. And when we were going to have a representative in, um, to our library, he was going um, to come by and he said, well, I, I, I want to come, but I don't know. Um, you know, I, I hate talking to politicians. And I said, why is that? And he goes, well, they don't want to listen to you anyway. I said, well, come on down and, and come. And, and just say what you like about the library or just say hello to him. Let him know you're a voter. He'll want to get your vote, at least if nothing else. The next thing um, you know, he came to the program that we had with the state rep. And he ended up talking like for 15, 20 minutes to the state rep about how great this library was. And I went, OK, I should have asked him sooner. And so always have everything ready to go, even if you don't have a program coming up or even if you don't have a millage coming up, but you still need to promote the library, have something to always have people walk out the library with, a bookmark with your hours on it, things that you do, um, the return of investment for businesses, things of that nature. And so when I was talking about the politician, here he is right here, that's our state rep for the area. Right over here is the um, uh, MLA, Michigan Library Association Executive, and me and some other community leaders. This is the general uh, superintendent of the local school district. Um, it doesn't matter what political party that they are in. I'm inviting any politician into the library. Um, and, I, and I have gotten, as I said before, I've gotten to know the local city leaders and state reps, but I never have turned them down publicly. Now, this gentleman right here, I have praised publicly. Um, profusely too because he helped with a bill in Michigan that allowed um, libraries to get some of their the recapture money back from taxes um, and that was a huge help and a big win for Michigan libraries and I was happy to work alongside Michigan Library Association to bring attention to um, local and state leaders who help libraries and so this was a chance for us to um, get our state rep into our library and to thank him personally. And I think that is always a plus. If you have time or have the ability to um, thank your state rep in person, do it. And even do it in a letter, that's another way of advocacy. They'll keep, they'll, it'll keep them on your side. Um, for the media or the newspapers, always know who the personal person is to contact. Know your end guy to get your, um, uh, programmed on the uh, on their uh, community calendar, so to speak, and um, I make my releases quick and concise. And especially when it comes to um, uh, uh, advocacy, like for getting funding and so forth, 
recently. Um, everyone should have gotten an ALA email that said, um, you know, let your congressman know that we still need funding and that uh, President Trump should not be cutting uh, funding to the museums and libraries. Um, I even shot something out to the local um, paper to say, um, you know, Royal Oak Township stands behind ALA and um, asking the president and the Senate and all congressmen to not stop funding for libraries because it's so vitally important. Did I get any response back from the newspapers? No, not yet. Um, perhaps I need to say it again. And this is, um, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Always tell the story over and over again and until they finally hear it. Like, can you hear me now? Um, I keep writers in the loop. Um, not only what I'm doing in my library, but what um, is happening nationally um, and I will just, you know, or statewide. And I always treat them as if they're my best friend and, they're, and with respect because I know their time is valuable. And sometimes if they're looking for a nice little um, human interest story, maybe something that I'm doing at my library that can promote my library will be of interest to them and they may take the time to come out and take a gander. Last but not least, um, um, I have my contact information here. Uh, I was going to share um, some of the handouts that I've made for uh, library hand, um, advocacy, um, but unfortunately, and I can't, um, the file got corrupted and I'm trying to fix it. Okay. But if you guys would want to get to me, I would be more than happy to send it to you. Mm -hmm. And I have two emails addressed, and I have a blog spot, to, uh, a blog. This is now Librarian at Large. So are there any questions? Great. All right. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, let's see, if anybody does have any questions, uh, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Or if you have any thoughts or ideas, or um, I'd like to hear from some, some people, too, um, successful um, advocacy uh, events or projects you've done or even unsuccessful ones um, you can get some tips or ideas from other people about how to redo it again potentially um, so please do go ahead and type into your question section there um, I thought that you can um, oh there's your website awesome okay <laughs> I didn't know I was gonna do that sorry <laughs> that's okay no that's great because you can share anything that's on your screen there yeah um, I thought um, it was very uh, good to hear the, the, that, um, especially about how hard it can be to advocate that, to be an advocate for your library, and that it, it can sometimes be um, overwhelming, uh, discouraging, <laughs> uh, when when you're you're saying the same things over again and people still, th they, they, it appears like they're hearing it for the first time that the library mm -hmm. is there and what the library does. And as there's, uh, there's a, uh, adage of that you have people uh, for children for teaching you have to repeat something seven times before they get it which seems like a lot but that's exactly how it works you just keep letting them know that um it's it it's it's there we're still here and we're not going anywhere <laughs> and that's a good news mm -hmm. um okay here's some questions um uh this is a good idea this is something obviously coming in new to a community how do you advocate as an outsider in your small community Any, maybe if you are new and you don't know anyone yet um i'm uh, i made one of the um better decisions i think um, when i hired in my library assistant she is someone from the community and mm -hmm. she has been in the community for a while so as an outsider as you can see um I'm working in a predominantly African-American community mm -hmm. um, and I drive like about a half hour to get to work and I'm new to this area. I've never been in that part of the county. And so when I hired her on, she had been in the library um, as a, a patron. So she kind of knew the flavor of what it's been like before I got there. And she knows the community around her. So everyone would come in and say, oh, it's Margaret here. And I'll say, no, my book's not here today, but I can help you. And they've gotten to see um, how we work together mm -hmm. and then how she's helping me and I'm helping her learn about library stuff. And as an outsider, I can tell them um, what I would like to do for the 
for their library, for their community. If I show an interest in their community and I show that I want to help them make changes, they are ready to bring, you know, take you in and listen to what you have to say. If I was just going in there to um, get a paycheck, and some people might say, they would know it. And I think by your actions, by the way you treat people, they can see what it is you want to do, and they they accept you. And mm -hmm. like I said, I do have a lot of community help, and I have some volunteers that, thank God I have them, because otherwise um, I would be lost. I wouldn't know whose kid was who. And that's the other thing I learned. In a small community, everyone knows everyone. And so yeah. it's been kind of nice. <laughs> It is, it is, it is, and that's what we're talking about here today is the small libraries, the rural libraries, or just the um, the community itself at the library, the 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 students in the in the university. It's a small community um, that they do know everybody. And I think that's a good tip, get connected with one of them. And eventually you won't be an outsider. If you just keep getting involved, attend, um, attend the meetings, uh, your city council mm -hmm. meetings, you know, get your face out there so people realize who you are. Um, and that's also how you can find out, I think, um, what is going on in your community? What are the needs of the town if you are new there? Um, attend the, the city council meetings, other organizational meetings, um, school board, um, any uh, like community organizations that have meetings and open meetings um, show up everywhere. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Any other questions for Lisa before we um, move on? Type in your question. If not, you do have access to um, her email is on the present. It was on the presentation. Um, check out her website. Um, uh, after uh, the session, everyone's uh, presentations, they will be emailing to me. So if you didn't get any of the websites for many of these presentations or the email address was the end of um, Lisa's here, you will um, have access to those afterwards when the recordings are all done uh, and along with the archives. Um, oh, we just have a comment. Really good presentation for you. Thank you. Good in all caps. Thank you. <laughs> Very oh, important good. Glad useful I information. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so it doesn't look like, unless somebody, like I said before, unless somebody's writing a novel for a new question, I think, <laughs> I think we're good. Thank you very much, Lisa. I am going to. Thank you, Krista.